Welcome back to Control System Lectures. I received a question a while back on Twitter asking how to go about solving a control system homework problem involving the root locus technique. I provided as much guidance as I could in 140 characters, but I think this topic needs its own video because I want to explain the relevance of these standard homework control problems to real-world applications so that you can get the most out of your homework exercises rather than just going through the motions to get the right answer. This will be the long way to solving this particular problem, but I think having the context will help you. This is the problem I received. If you'd like to read the whole thing, pause this video now, but I'll write most of it out throughout this video anyway. So let's get to it. We're told that we have a diesel engine that's driving a load, and we're given a transfer function, g of s, that relates the fuel valve setting, v of s, in radians, to the load shaft speed, y of s, in radians per second. And I'll draw this in block diagram form so that you can see that the valve setting is the input into G of S and the shaft speed is the output. The fuel valve setting is provided by a PID controller and we're given this transfer function, G sub C of S, and I'll write it out here. Except for tau, which is the red letter, this is a variable integral action time in seconds and we get to choose this value. And you can see that this is the transfer function of a PID controller because we have the proportional part, 5, the integral part, 5 over tau, and the derivative part, 0 0.3. But the proportional and the derivative part are fixed. We're told in the problem that they have to be these values. So keep in mind as we go through this problem that we're really only tuning one parameter, tau, in this PID controller. Let me draw the complete feedback control system block diagram, but I didn't give myself enough room, so I'm going to move this over first. And this is what the system looks like. The input into the control system is our reference shaft speed. This is the speed that we want our diesel engine to drive the shaft at. We compare that speed against the measured speed to generate an error term. We feed that error term through our PID controller to generate a valve angle, which in turn affects the shaft speed of the diesel engine. And now we can finally get to what the problem is asking us to do. The first thing is that it wants us to sketch a root locus for the system. And we can do that since we're only varying one variable, tau. We also want to use that root locus plot to determine the value of tau required so that our system has a damping ratio no less than 0.7. Also, we need to estimate the location of the closed loop poles of the system. Okay, that's it. That seems simple enough, right? But before we get started, let's just take a step back and see what we can learn from just the way that the problem is set up. Modern diesel engines are very complicated devices, but we can still reason through how we would expect a diesel engine to behave, and therefore how the transfer function that we're given of the diesel engine should also behave. The fuel valve is located between the fuel tank and the combustion chamber of the engine. And as the fuel valve opens larger, more fuel is able to pour into the engine from the fuel tank. And with that, more energy is released through combustion, causing the shaft to accelerate. And if you open the valve to a constant angle and leave it there, so basically it's a step input, the fuel into the engine would be fixed at a set flow rate. And the engine would accelerate until the energy lost through friction, heat, and sound matches the energy added from the fuel. At this equilibrium point, there is no extra energy to go into accelerating the engine, and the shaft speed would be constant. So if we apply the step input to this transfer function, we would expect to see the output ramp up quickly at first, as the difference between the energy in and the energy lost is large at the beginning, and then slowly taper off to a fixed shaft speed. Let's try this out in MATLAB and see what we get. First, I'll set the diesel engine transfer function from the problem using the tf command in MATLAB. Then I'll plot the step response of the system using the step command. And check this out. We got pretty much what we expected. The step response increases very quickly at the beginning and eventually tapers off to a steady state value of 10. Since the step command applies a step of 1, we can interpret this as opening the valve by 1 radian will produce a steady state shaft speed of 10 radians per second. And we'll get to that steady state condition after about five or six seconds. This sanity check on transfer functions is important because whether you're given a transfer function like we were 
or if you generated one yourself, you should always double check that it's producing results close to what you expect. If the step response had produced something like this, then we would have really good reason to suspect that this transfer function has an error and we wouldn't want to design our controller to a bad model of our system. Alright, now we know we have a plant that we can trust. So we want to adjust the PID controller so that it will automatically regulate the valve angle so that our engine spins at the commanded rate. But beyond that, we also want the controller to accelerate the shaft in such a way that the total closed loop system behaves similar to a second order system with damping ratio no less than 0.7. Let's take a moment to realize exactly what this is saying. A second order system has this form, omega naught squared over s squared plus two zeta omega naught s plus omega naught squared. And for a set natural frequency, we can vary the damping ratio zeta from zero, or no damping at all, to one, a critically damped system. These two extremes are easy enough to plot by hand. If the system has no damping at all, then the response to a step input would look something like this with the output oscillating between 0 and 2. If this was our closed loop system response, when we stepped the reference speed to 1 radian, the engine would accelerate to twice the commanded value before decelerating back down to 0, and we continue this cycle indefinitely. Not a great controller. On the other hand, a critically damped system would have no overshoot at all, and would slowly approach the commanded rate, eventually reaching it at time equals infinity. This is a good damping ratio for systems that can't afford even the slightest amount of overshoot. The problem states that this system needs damping greater than or equal to 0.7. Or in other words, the system can accept a small amount of overshoot, or the shaft speed accelerating slightly past the commanded speed in order to gain a faster response. The response should look something like this, in between the two extremes. A little bit of overshoot, but we'll see by the end of this video that the zeros in this transfer function make it behave a little bit different than the standard second order system, but the overall shape is still there. At this point we have this block diagram. We have the PID controller with the variable tau that we get to choose, we have our plant, which is the diesel engine, and we have the feedback signal, which is the measured shaft speed. Now the problem doesn't state how we measure the shaft speed, but just based on how the problem is set up, we can infer something about it. Namely, since the feedback path has a transfer function of 1, that means that our measurement, or our tachometer, is so fast and exact in this problem that we can treat it as a perfect measurement, or a 1, which is called unity feedback. You can see that with unity feedback, our measured shaft speed is exactly our true shaft speed. Now in real life, our measurement would lag slightly behind the true shaft speed, plus there'd be some error associated with it as well. But as long as the error in measurement lag is small compared to the dynamics in the engine itself, then it's acceptable to ignore this process. Now whether to include measurement dynamics or not is up to you as the design engineer. And if you're unsure if you should model something, I just err on the side of modeling it. You can always remove it later if you find out it doesn't impact your design. Alright, now that we have a good understanding of how the problem is set up, we can finally start the problem at hand. Let's sketch a root locus for this system and see what we can learn from it. If you haven't already, I recommend you watch Sketching Root Locus, uh, both part one and two of my videos, and I'll put a link right here. But the standard form for the root locus looks like this. And from this form, we can use all the rules we learned to sketch a root locus, which is essentially plotting how the roots of a closed loop transfer function move as we sweep the gain from zero to infinity. In our case, the gain is tau. And our g of s, which is the total open loop system, is the combination of our PID controller and the plant. I've circled it in green up above. Combining these two transfer functions is relatively straightforward, but you'll need to rearrange them using some algebra. The three components of the PID controller have a common denominator of s times tau, and when you multiply it with the plant, you get this third order transfer function. Again, this is the total open loop transfer function of our system. And if you recall, for unity feedback systems in the form that we have, the characteristic equation of the closed loop system is 1 plus the open loop transfer function, just like we see in the standard form of the root locus method. However, you can see that our characteristic equation doesn't look like the root locus standard form at all. In the standard form, the variable gain k appears only once, and our variable gain tau is scattered throughout the transfer function. But we can collect all of the terms with tau in them, and then divide out all the remaining terms 
to get our characteristic equation into the root locus standard form. I'm going to give this a second to sink in because it's not obvious what we just did. We rearranged the closed loop characteristic equation and divided by some number of terms that didn't have tau in them. In our case, that was just the number 5. And at first you'd think we'd change the entire behavior of the transfer function. However, you have to keep in mind that we're just looking at the characteristic equation right now, or the denominator of the closed loop system. We would have also divided the numerator by 5 as well, so that the total transfer function would remain unchanged. But since at this moment we're only concerned with the poles of the system, I'm only showing the characteristic equation. Okay, this system has three zeros and no poles, so right off the bat we should realize that our plot will have three lines coming in from infinity, since there are more zeros than poles, and the loci start at the open loop poles and end at the open loop zeros. We can easily see that one of the zeros is at the origin, and the other two can be found using the quadratic equation. I found them to be around minus 20.5 plus or minus 9.5i. And I'll mark the zeros on my root locus plot, one at the origin and the other two where I just found them. And using rule 8, I can see that the three asymptotes cross the real axis at the center of mass of all of the poles and zeros, which works out to be about minus 13.7. And they cross the real line at angles plus 60, minus 60, and 180 degrees. So I'll draw those in with yellow dashed lines. And now using rule 4, I can draw the locus along the real axis to the left of the odd critical frequencies, which fits along our asymptote nicely. And the other two roots come in from infinity, and they bend off the asymptote as they near the real axis. One of the roots goes towards the right to the zero at the origin, and the other root goes towards the left to meet up with the root that is coming in from infinity from the right. And these two roots eventually meet up somewhere, and then one goes up to the positive 9.50, and the other down to the negative 9.50. And you'll probably notice that I'm not giving too much thought to the graph at this point. At this point, I actually have enough to go on to get an estimate of the value of tau that will put the closed loop poles where I want, without having to concern myself too much about the actual shape of the root locus plot. The reason I don't care about this blue region is because I can see from this graph really quickly that the closed loop poles won't be anywhere near here. I just need to estimate the gain that will put the two poles that come in from the right right around this area, at 45 degrees off the real axis. This has a damping ratio of about 0.7. And this is all the problem's asking for. If I wanted a root locus plot more accurate than an estimate, I would have used a tool like MATLAB rather than working through the math by hand. I'll show you that method in a bit. But that's what's so powerful about the root locus method is that you can do a lot of this stuff with estimates all by hand. Okay, let me quickly redraw this because it's starting to get messy. I know for tau equals zero, the two rightmost poles start at infinity, and as I increase tau, they begin to move along these curves towards the left half plane. You'll notice for low values of tau, this system is unstable. And at some value of tau, the two poles are on the imaginary axis, and the damping ratio is zero. And this system would oscillate forever like I showed you earlier. Still, not a great system for what we need. Therefore, I want to increase the gain just a little bit more so that the two dominant poles are here, about 45 degrees off the real axis, where the damping ratio is about 0.7. So, how do I find the gain associated with this? And again, this is pretty straightforward, but you just need a little bit of trigonometry. We know that the pole is going to lie very close to the point where the asymptote and the line of constant damping cross. And I can find that point very easily using the law of sines and I found it to be right around minus 8.7 plus or minus 8.7i. Now I just zipped through this math really quickly, but I think you should have no problem setting up the problem and recreating it on your own. Okay, now here's the cool part. We know that where a pole exists, the characteristic equation equals zero. And we also know that the pole here needs to be around minus 8.7 plus or minus 8.7i. So if we plug this pole into our characteristic equation, we can solve for the value of tau required to make it equal zero. And to save just a little bit of writing time, I copied the characteristic equation that we solved for earlier on in this video. And if you plug in this pole for every value of s in this equation and solve for tau, you'll find that it needs to be equal to about 0.16 or greater but you're not going to get exactly a real number of around 0.16. There's going to be some residual imaginary component as well. 
Normally there would be no imaginary component. The reason why it exists here is that this isn't an exact pole location, this is an estimate from our root locus plot. So as long as your residual imaginary component is small, you know that you've picked a pole location that is very close to the real location. The last thing I want to estimate is the location of the third pole. And this is really easy since we know that the center of mass of the poles stay constant when we adjust the gain, which we solved earlier to be minus 13.7. And since our two poles are at minus 8.7, it's really easy to determine that the third pole needs to be at minus 23.6. And even though this graph up here is looking like a bit of a mess, I'll just draw it in anyway. And that's the end of the problem. But let's go over to MATLAB and redo it and see how we did with our estimations. All right, I'll start by setting tau equal to 0.16, and then I'll define s as a standalone transfer function, which will make defining the system transfer functions easier going forward. Our PID controller is this, g sub c, and our plant, g, is this from earlier. And I can calculate the closed loop transfer function using the feedback command with a 1 in the feedback path. Remember, unity feedback. And I can plot the location of the closed loop poles and zeros with the command pz map. And I apologize for the font being really small and tough to read, but perhaps you can see that the two dominant poles and the third pole are all close to our estimate. And the damping ratio of the dominant poles are near 0.7. And I feel that this is close enough for a hand approximation using the root locus method. Not too bad. All right, now let's see what the step response looks like for our system. Again, it's pretty close to our expectations. You can see that the system has a slight overshoot, which is characteristic of an underdamped system, and that the steady state value is 1, which means that if we tell our controller to rotate the shaft at 9 radians per second, the shaft will be rotating pretty close to 9 radians per second after about half a second. And finally, the last thing I want to show you is how this system compares against a second order system with the same natural frequency and damping ratio as the dominant poles in our system. Here I define a second order system with two poles at minus 7.55, plus or minus 7.55i, and with a gain of 114. And I'll plot the step response on top of our existing response. And you can see that they're not exactly the same, and that's because our system was a third order system and we had two zeros as well, which will affect the shape of the response. So you can see from this that you can't exactly predict the response of a system even if its dominant poles are similar to a second order system. But like we did here, in a lot of cases, you can get really close. So that's all I wanted to show you for this problem. Thanks for watching, and if you have any problems you'd like me to walk through in the future, you can send them to me through YouTube or on Twitter at Brian B. Douglas.